Alright, today is Sunday, April 24th, and this is a recap for the stock market activities last week and outlook for the week to come. Folks, I got a good one for you tonight, and let's dive right into it, in focus. Can you hear me now? The bears are asking, because up until recently, we had some doubters that this is a bear market. Let's start by the breaking news that we got today. French President Macron got re-elected again, and can we get some uh, Macron optimism? I doubt it, because this was expected. It was no surprise to anybody at all that Macron will secure another term. But boy, do we need some optimism or what? Because on Friday, the stock market was down big. We're talking the biggest drop since November of 2020. And look at the indices. The Dow was down almost a thousand points in a single day. And the losses for the week are even more stunning than this. We're seeing signs that these are not normal times. We're seeing signs that the biggest shoe is about to drop. We haven't seen anything yet. For example, the volatility in the euro-dollar futures is absolutely stunning, indicating that perhaps the Fed will have to tighten more than they've been telling us. Furthermore, look at these European negative yielding bonds. We're talking about multi-trillion dollars worth of losses since the November peak. We're talking about almost $10 trillion. Poof gone. And this is an indicator that central banks across the world are about to tighten aggressively. Of course, the bond market got it right. The bond market has been a disaster, indicating correctly so that the Fed will have no choice but to aggressively tighten the monetary policy. And it's not just the Federal Reserve, by the way. It is central banks across the globe. Yet up until recently, the equities market has been sanguine about all of this. The equities market has been looking for dip-buying opportunities. Back to all-time highs, they kept saying. But as of late, we're starting to see signs that even the equities market market is getting the memo. And Bank of America says investors just pulled a massive $17.5 billion out of global equities. And they are just getting started, baby. They caution that those outflows could well deepen. Since November 2021, NASDAQ peak inflows to stocks have occurred in 16 of 20 weeks for a total of $229 billion, while private clients bought stocks 17 out of 20 weeks. What does that say? It says that we have a degree of complacency. They're still buying the dip. The equities market still did not get the memo. Yet we're starting to see signs that the equities market is finally getting the memo. Breaking down some of the equities outflows, Bank of America strategists noted data showing Europe so the 10th straight week of outflow, $2.9 billion, while $1.6 billion exited financials as money flowed back into buying technology sector debt. Uh-oh. Materials, meanwhile, marked a record eight weeks of inflows. I'm assuming this changed this week because we saw outflows out of materials. Look at the outflows out of financials big time, and my hunch is we will see inflows back into financials and perhaps outflows out of materials and energy. But here's what Bank of America is trying to say. Look at the global equity flows. Do you see a sharp decline in the dark blue line of the chart? Of course not. We're talking about over a decade of inflows that we now have to unwind. You think that would happen easily? You think that would happen with no victims in this stampede to get out of the equities market? Of course not. It will be a massive cascading outflow of the stock market. If this is the case, then the pain has just started. And even famed investor, the big short Michael Burry, is warning that the best growth stocks can crash and the Fed might not intervene because the Fed will be out of ammo when that happens. But the level of arrogance in the stock market is still here. Look no further than Tesla investors, for example. That will be the big one. And when Tesla crashes, that will mark the end of the bull market once and for all. But for now, for now, the market is getting really, really oversold. So can we get a rebound? My answer is yes. And my expectations are that we're going to get a rebound this upcoming week. Now, will the rebound last? That is a different question entirely, because it will depend on earnings. We have big cap technology earnings coming out this week. Will we have a savior in Apple and Facebook and Alphabet and Microsoft? We'll see. But for now, about a week or so, we talked about an important technical pattern called the Wyckoff upthirst. And so far, it has been a spot on pattern, predicting ahead of time that the rally that we saw in March was a bear market rally. Now, I'm going to read to you what they're saying 
then I'm going to explain it to you in the charts using the cash index. So don't be stuck up on the numbers here because they're looking at the futures chart. I'll be looking at the cash index. But here it is. The sign of weakness in the S&P 500 served as the largest down wave signaled a damage of the uptrend since the thing low in March 2020. The selling climax low on January 24th, 2022 together with the automatic rally AR, which was a technical rally formed after an oversold condition defined the range bound condition between 4200 and 4600. The strong rally in mid of March 2022 created a Wyckoff upthrust, also known as a false breakout, followed by increasing of supply in the down wave, which pointed to further weakness for the S&P 500. So this is what they're talking about. This is the SPX, by the way, the cash index. Since the top in 2021, we've been seeing a massive wave of selling all the way down to around 4,222. This was the selling climax. Look at the RSI. This is when the market was oversold, quote unquote. Then we got the automatic rally, AR, all the way to around 4,600. Then we got the pullback, the secondary test, which got us down all the way around 4,100. Now, these numbers will differ from chart to chart chart. If you're using the futures chart, the numbers will be different, but the pattern remains the same. After the secondary test, we got the double bottom formation at around 4,200. Since then, we got a massive rally that a lot of folks assumed will take us back to all-time highs. Not for us watching this pattern, because in a Wyckoff upthrust pattern, we usually see the UT part, which is the false breakout, and that took us all the way back to around 4,600. Then we got the pullback the redistribution, and we're now down at around 4,276. So what do they see now? Should the S&P 500 break below the support at 4,100 formed by the swing low in February 2022, followed by the inability to rally up above 4,280, sell-off can be expected to test the low target. What is the low target, you might ask? Here it is. Based on the point and figure chart projection, there is enough causes built for the S&P 500 to test 3,650, which is another 14% drop. This is also the previous support level where the accumulation structure formed in 2020. This could be the low where the bulls are hoping for, should it happen. To violate this bearish scenario, the S&P 500 is to reverse the downswing and rally above 4,400 to 4,500 before committing above 4,600, followed by a shallow pullback as a test. Otherwise, the directional bias for the S&P 500 is to the downside. Here's the translation. We should be able to rebound from this point on all the way to 4,500. 4400 to erase the bearish outlook but 4400 will not be enough on its own we have to go to 4500 and then 4600 and retest 4500 as support if the chart fails to rally from this point on, then we're going down to 4,200 before we get a rebound. If that fails to go all the way to 4,400, then we're going down to the secondary test at around 4,114 and a half in the cash index chart. And if that fails, then we're going down 14%. But rest assured, if you're already wet your diaper, you got JP Morgan Chase, who say expect the S&P 500 earnings to blow past the gloomy estimates. The question is, which one will it be? Which one will it be the savior? Will it be Apple? Will it be Alphabet? Will it be Facebook? Will it be Microsoft? One of the big guys has to deliver. Absent of that, we're going down big. Let's move on to the market information, and we start with the closing of the indices last week. And here we go. The Dow Industrial Average on Friday was down 981.36 points or a decline of 2.82%. The Nasdaq was down big by 335.36 points or a decline of 2.55%. Likewise, the S&P 500 was down in the red 121.88 points or a decline of 2.77%. The sector's performances on Friday ugly across the board, everything is down, no metals at all, and the laggers were led by materials, healthcare, and communication services. Now, let's contrast this with the weekly performance, and at number one, capturing the gold, the silver, and the bronze, real estate, the only sector managing to close in the green for the week. The rest of them, all in the red, led by communication services, materials, and energy. What about the advanced to decline ratios on Friday? NYSE, 11% advancing versus a stunning 87% declining. The NASDAQ, 21% advancing versus 74% declining. 
Commodities. It was an ugly day on Friday, down across the board with few exceptions, such as the rebound in OJ, lean hogs, oats, canola, soybean oil, on the news that Indonesia will ban the imports, or excuse me, the exports of palm oil. So we're going to see canola and soybean oil moving higher from this point on. But it was ugly across the board, but not as ugly as the equities market. So that begs the question, is what we saw, the sell-off that we saw in commodities-related stocks, think for example Alcoa, Freeport McMoran, the fertilizer stocks, energy stocks. Was that an overreaction? Because when we look at the commodities, copper, for example, it didn't go down at all. So was the sell-off in Freeport an overreaction, for example? Will we see a rebound in this upcoming week? This is exactly what I'm looking for. Let's talk about some commodities news. The sell-off and the weakness in energy is related to the shutdowns in China. We're seeing shutdowns in Shanghai continuing. We're seeing talks about a shutdown in Beijing now. And if the Chinese economy is slowing down due to these shutdowns, these draconian shutdowns, I should say, that we should see oil going down further. But the resiliency of crude is absolutely stunning. You think about the biggest consumer of crude on the planet shutting down, yet we're seeing crude prices above 100. The resiliency is important because it is a telltale that if we have a reopening of the Chinese economy, you will see crude oil prices rebounding significantly higher again. Likewise, we saw stocks like aluminum produce or Alcoa, for example, down big this week, over double digits, off concerns that the volume is low, that the demand is weakening, but we can attribute that to China once again, because Chinese imports of aluminum were down 4.6% year over year in March, suggesting that these lockdowns are impacting the Chinese demand dramatically. So if the Chinese demand is down for aluminum, for oil, will it be down for iPhones, for example? This is what we're about to find out this week when we get Apple's earnings. But it is a major problem when we talk about the demand for EVs, for example. That comes hand in hand with the demand for aluminum. So the question once again, was it an overreaction, the sell-off in commodities-related stocks? We'll see. But for now, when we talk about EVs, a top lithium expert, another commodity, an important one, that has been surging out of whack, agrees with Elon Musk that there is not enough of the crucial metal to meet booming demand. The demand is sky high. Every manufacturer now wants to produce EVs. Where is the supply, you might ask? It is nowhere to be found. The levels that we're in right now, 2021, were pretty much at the same levels we had back in 2018. The lithium is nowhere to be found. This is a major, major problem. And by the way, this EV lunacy is pushing the prices of traditional energy higher. Take, for example, coal. We're not seeing any stop in sight here for coal prices. Union Pacific, matter of fact, the largest railroad operator in this country said, we're definitely seeing customers wanting to use more coal right now. Interesting. Lastly, when we talk about fertilizers, we're seeing stocks like Mosaic and uh, Nutrient, for example, down big. And the reason is we're seeing fertilizer prices also taking a break with a pullback. Look at, for example, Tampa ammonia prices in this country. They're moving down and the expectations are they're going to move down further. Perhaps natural gas will go down a little more. And therefore, hold your horses. I know a lot of you want to buy these commodities-related stocks because you missed out, and now you think this is the dip to buy. I say hold your horses. Let the air come out a little bit more, and then at some point we'll assess whether we should go back or not. Moving on to the big casino, the options market. What happened on Friday? The hottest table by far is Apple, with around 1.2 million contracts traded for the name. Around 51% of those were calls. And at number two, Tesla, the souffle, at around 950,000 contracts for the name. Look at this. Only 48% of those were calls. They're buying more puts than calls, at least on Friday. NVIDIA, at number three, at around 550,000 contracts. About 67% of those were calls. We're watching names like Netflix, of course, for an upcoming rebound. We'll talk more in the charts analysis. We're waiting for a rebound. The rebound will happen mostly in the oversold names. But for now, let's move on to the unusual activities that took place in the options market on Friday. We start with the ticker EEM. This is for emerging markets, the ETF. They're buying puts, so perhaps they see the dollar moving higher. They bought the 39 puts for the expiration date, May 6th, with expectations that the EEM EM could go down by more than 8% by then. The spread was wide because the open interest was really low, but they paid around 
two bucks and a half a piece to enter this trade all in all spending around five million dollars what about the ticker t triple q's this is the leverage index for the q's the nasdaq the buying calls this time around every time we see this kind of buying of the t triple q's you know the retail crowd is behind it and i believe they will be right this time around because we're so oversold it is almost a certainty we're gonna get a rebound the question is when and how long will it last but for now they bought the t triple q's calls the 47 calls with the expiration date this upcoming Friday April 29th with the expectations that the name could move higher by more than 13% by then they paid around 55 cents a piece to enter this trade all in all spending around half a million dollars what about the ticker RUN and this is for Sunrun a solar manufacturer and RUN because this is a name that could rebound higher we'll talk again in the charts analysis because it is oversold for now and somebody bought the 25 calls for the expiration date June June 17th with the expectations that Sunrun could move higher by more than 23% by then. They paid around one buck and 40 cents a piece to enter this trade, all in all spending around 1.2 million dollars. Lastly, what about the ticker AFRM, a firm the buying puts this time around, the 29 puts for the expiration date May 20, with the expectations that the name could go down by more than 7% by then. They paid around four bucks a piece to enter this trade, all in all spending around three million dollars. Moving on to the heat map analysis. What do we see here this is the heat map on friday a bloodbath across the board with very very few exceptions number one we have twitter and this is for the obvious reasons of course then we have ea and take two two video game companies that were trading higher we have jd in the chinese stocks we have in defensives kmb kimberly clark the name reported earnings they displayed their pricing power as an inflationary hedge passing that extra cost to the end consumer the name unlike procter and gamble for example was down big heading to earnings so the reaction was also big kimberly clark at some point of the day was up by almost 10 percent then we have names like uh lmt for example lockheed martin and industrials also moving higher and in energy the ticker slb which also reported earnings but besides that it was a bloodbath no doubt about it let's contrast this with the weekly heat map the bloodbath was in commodities in energy and materials for example healthcare got shot the big caps got shot the software names got shot there were a few places to hide in mainly in defensives in reits in tesla and financials and the value name ibm but besides that it was a bloodbath across the board maybe it is the climax of selling we'll see but let's talk about some major news for certain companies. We start with Meta, Facebook, reporting earnings this week. We continue to follow the story, the scandal, of Sheryl Sanderberg, who used Facebook resources, Meta resources, to tell a story about her ex, the embattled CEO of Activision Blizzard. Now, you see, if any of us post what Facebook deems as misinformation, on their platform we get banned right away but here we have the top shot in the company Sheryl Sandberg who's abusing her power to manipulate the algos to kill a story a negative story about her ex-boyfriend this should be the number one story in business news right now not the garbage of Elon Musk buying Twitter then let's talk about Netflix we have more proof now that what I said about Netflix is right the spending like a drunken sailor turns out they're spending 30 million dollars her episode for Stranger Things. Now, I did not watch Stranger Things. Maybe it's a good show. I don't know. But $30 million per episode? Even Games of Thrones did not cost that much. And now you wonder why Netflix is in the toilet. Then let's talk about Caesars and Las Vegas in general, by the way. These casino companies will get wiped out in the next recession. Completely wiped out. Number one, their financials are garbage. Number two, they keep squeezing their customers for parking fees overcharge fees whatever the f fees and when i used to work in las vegas in these casino companies when we we're talking about strategies i would object and say you gotta treat the customer like kings and queens you gotta be inviting for the customer not charging them for every single move how about we charge for oxygen they did not listen because the people who are running las vegas right now are the greedy corporate types who only care about the stock price and the short-term gains they don't care at all about the future of this city, the future of the business, and the sustainability of visitors to this city. They don't care at all. And my fear is Las Vegas will get wiped out completely when the next recession happens. And now we got Caesars who quietly eliminated the loyalty perks for their customers. Even the most loyal customers are getting hit. This is absolute garbage from Las Vegas. Then let's talk about Gap. 
gap was down big on Friday. Number one, the old Navy CEO exited. Number two, we have a massive downgrade on gap. And of course, they should be glad that they signed Kanye West. This should be a business lesson, by the way, for all of these companies wanting to sign celebrities. You get the pump and then you get the dump right away. Who walks out with the money? Kanye West, not the shareholders of gap. Then let's talk about the EV manufacturers. We have Honda. Honda is announcing a pair of high performance EVs. And I say finally, Honda is pumping their EV production, even if they have it or not, doesn't matter. It remains the most undervalued stock in the EV sector of the stock market. They missed out on the EV pump because they're stupid. The management's stupid. They missed the opportunity of pumping their stock by saying, hey, in 2025, 2030, 20 whatever, we're going to produce an EV. That's all what you had to say. But they did not. We'll see if the market is going to appreciate that or not. At this stage of course. Then we have GM who signed a deal with Glencore to secure some cobalt for the batteries. I'd rather be in Glencore stock, not in GM. Moving on to the heat map, the weekly heat map for the ETFs. Again, a bloodbath across the board, unless you were in REITs or defensives. The consumer staples, the XLP. Besides that, you got wiped out. No exception at all. Everything is down. Commodities are down big. Uranium down big. Gas down big. Gold down big. International markets are down big. But specifically the EWZ, the winner year to date. Why is this important? If the drop in the EWZ is sustainable, meaning it's not an overreaction, then it is a confirmation that we're seeing the top in commodities. We will see a lot of profit taking commodities, which means we're getting closer and closer to the end game. So watch out for the EWZ. This is an important indicator. But I remain bullish in Indonesia, for example. Indonesia remains the alternative for China for now. They're enjoying a booming economy. We have some news about cooking oil. We'll talk about that in another video. But for now, I remain long Indonesia. Moving on to charts. And we start with the chart of the SPY, the S&P 500, an hourly chart. A massive flush down, no doubt about it. Since the gap and crap, look at these candles. Not even a single green candle in sight, which means we're about to get a rebound. Just at least an oversold rebound. Look at the RSI. Now, my preference is if we open up gapping down, let's say at around 422, then I'll be buying with both hands. Because in all likelihood, we will get a rebound, an oversold rebound. This one would be easy. Let's hope that the morons are not going to buy the futures and open the market gapping higher. That could be a problem because the gap up might not stick. For the love of God, let's let the market go down. Let it gap down 422 and then we will see a rebound. That would be a beautiful bounce to play. We'll see what happens. But the point is we're waiting and waiting and waiting for a rebound, an oversold rebound rally. Here is the daily chart for the continuous contract for the SPY, the S&P 500. Negative divergences in the momentum indicators. The volume is moving higher on down days. All signs favoring the bears. But we're now at a critical support of 4,232. If that support is gone, then the bull's hope of a reverse head and shoulder formation is poof gone. What about the SPX, the cash index, the daily chart? The rejection from the 200 days moving average in white was a sign to short, a signal to short, along with the negative divergence on the RSI. Now, can we get a rebound from 4200? I certainly think so. But pay attention now. When I say I'm hoping for a gap down, I mean opening down at around 4200. And then we see a rebound higher from that point on. On a lot of volume, lots of buying, that will be a solid, reliable trading bottom. Otherwise, we're going down to 4000. And... Between you and I, I think even if we get a rebound, it would be another bull trap, another oversold rally that will fade away, and we're going down to 4,000 either way. And 4,000 is not the worst outcome, by the way, because when we zoom out to a weekly chart for the SPX, the cash index, look at the 200 moving average from a weekly chart perspective. You think we're not going to go down, retouch that support at some point? Think again, because what if this is an ABC pattern. We will see the chart going down all the way to the 200 moving average on the weekly chart. It has been support for years. It should be support this time around. And here is the hourly chart for the NASDAQ, the Qs, another flush down, barely a green candle in sight since the gap and crap at around 347. Again, I'm hoping for a gap down because the chart is already oversold. So we're waiting and anticipating an oversold rally. My hope is we go down to 320. My number right here is conservative, 316.46. We could actually find support at around 320. If we gap down there and we see rebound on a lot of volume, that would be a good sign that we have a tradable bottom. The bottom will be confirmed by one of the big cap earnings, be it Apple, be it Meta, be it Alphabet, be it Microsoft. One of these earnings 
has to be pristine. And here is the daily chart for the continuous contract for the NASDAQ. Uh-oh. We're looking down at 13,300. The most important and critical support. Why? Because it also comes hand in hand with the support with the trend line in yellow, which I'm going to show you when I zoom out in a minute. But look at the momentum indicators. They're already in negative divergences. The volume is moving higher on down days. All of these are bad signs for the bulls, good signs for the bears. But at some point, the bearish momentum will also peak. Are we peaking now? The bulls better hope so, because when we zoom out to a weekly chart and we clean it up a little bit, leaving the trend line of support, look at that. If that line is broken, oh boy, we could see a massive massive flush down the likes of the crash of 09. So the bulls better hope for a rebound at this point. The problem is, what if this is an ABC pattern? And we're about to break that trend line and go even further down. This is what the bears are betting for. Moving on to the IWM and hourly chart once again, we're below 196 and a half and we are anticipating a rebound an oversold rebound. Again, the hope is we will see a gap down in the morning at around 191 and a half, and then we get a solid rebound from a reliable support, at least in the short term. Here's the problem. When we zoom out to a weekly chart for the RUT, the Russell 2000, look at the negative divergences in both momentum indicators, the RSI, the MACD, and it appears that we had a failure once again at around 2100, which means this chart will flush down sooner or later. We're getting closer and closer and closer to the crash. That doesn't mean that in the meantime, we cannot get a rebound, at least an oversold rebound. What about the Dixie, the dollar index, the daily chart? You cannot say anything here until and unless we get a reversal candle. What is a reversal candle? It is a candle that will get us below 99.9 number one. Number two, it's going to erase multi days worth of candles. For now, we did not get any candle like this. So what about gold? Gold is hanging by a thread right now at around 1,925. Either it's going to happen or not. Breaking below 1,925 would be a disappointment for the gold bugs because it will end any hope for a major move higher above 2000, at least for now. So this is a must keep support for the bulls. What about crude? This is a four hours chart for Brent. The chart already violated the support of 105.84. So we're now looking down at 100. If we get down to 100, we will see if we have a rebound, an oversold rebound or not. But for now, the assumption is we're going down to 100. And here's a daily chart for the 10 year yield. It appears that we're getting closer and closer and closer to the top for now. The problem is, will the top come out of good news or bad news? Good news would be inflation cooling down. Bad news would be the outlook. The economic outlook got really sour, which by the way, could come hand in hand with a reinversion of the yield curve. So watch out for that. And here's the chart of the TLT, a weekly chart. Waiting and waiting and waiting for a rebound. I believe we can get one this week, depending on the macro outlook and depending on earnings. Here's the VIX four hours chart. A massive, massive rally of 20, the support of 20. We got a rally of around 43% in what? A single day? This is a massive move in the VIX. The problem is... We're getting a little overbought and the charts for the SPY, for example, getting a little oversold. You put two and two together, the VIX might pull back and we could see the SPY rebanding. Here's the VXN, the VIX for the NASDAQ, still in positive momentum, still moving higher, closing at the highs of the day, but it's also getting closer and closer to becoming overbought. On the other hand, the Qs is getting closer and closer of being oversold. Again, you put two and two together, we're waiting and waiting for a rebound in the Qs and a pullback in the VXN. What about Apple, the big kahuna? This is a daily chart. The chart failed from the upper edge of the channel. We're now looking down at the support of 157. And here's an important note. If you're going to play an oversold rally, don't buy the big caps. The big caps are going to report earnings. The premiums are going to be high. You're better off playing something else. What about Tesla? This is a 30 minutes chart. Massive rejection around 1,090 and a half. It got down to 995. Caught support from there, but could not make it above the soft resistance at around 1,025. The assumption is that the chart has to go down, revisit 995 once again. If it cannot find support from that point on, then it has to go down to close the gap at around 981.75. It is yet another bear flag formation, by the way, just like the previous one, which took us down from around 1,150 all the way to 995. And we got bad news for the souffle. We have Reverend Elon who keeps touting the miracle of self-driving, which is nothing mere of a disaster. We have a Tesla crashing into a private jet on the so-called smart summon mode. What will happen in the dumb summon mode? Look at this. 
the souffle just keeps moving as if the plane is not even there so yeah tesla deserves to be a two thousand dollar stock because it's the future bro this is the future anyways reverend elon is also getting into a lot of trouble over the weekend he took a shot at another oligarch bill gates comparing him to an emoji of a pregnant man no wonder why elon musk wants to buy twitter because they can ban him for this tweet had i tweeted this i would have been banned for bullying the richest man on the planet used to be at least bill gates i should say the top criminal in the world but when Elon Musk does it, ah, eh, we gotta bend the rules a little bit for the richest man on the planet right now. Moving on to tulips, Bitcoin, what do we see here? Again, if this bear flag plays out, along with the rejection at 42,000, and the inevitable destination will be 35,750. You cannot be bullish in tulips right now. Even if you want to play a rebound, play it in stocks, not in tulips. And here is AMC I'm expanding the MACD indicator on the two hours chart. Are we seeing the beginning of another positive momentum? If it is, then I'm going to be buying calls. And hopefully the calls will get us all the way back to 21. Wait and see. Now, you can play the oversold rebound in many different ways. We discussed certain opportunities, certain charts that I continue to watch, waiting and waiting for the rebound. Here are some ideas. And again, all what you have to do is look at your charts, your program, and find the oversold charts, specifically the ones that happen to be more popular. These are the ones that are going to rebound the most. For example, here's Spotify, a three hours chart. Look at the hour side. Every time we got down there, we got an oversold rally. It did not last, but again, it was a sizable rally worthy of trading. So I'm watching Spotify for an upcoming rebound if we get that in an oversold rally. Another name that I continue to watch is Shopify. I would probably play the rebound in this name because we usually get a double digits rebound when the RSI gets this oversold. I'm waiting and waiting and waiting for the rebound opportunity. Another name, look at CRM, Salesforce. Once again, a three hours chart way oversold if we have a rebound in the market crm will move higher significantly in a rebound rally another one the ticker ftnt fortinet way oversold in the three hours waiting and waiting for a rebound rally is another one the ticker nee this is for next era energy the three hours chart way oversold begging for a rebound rally the hope is we get a gap down and it gets really really oversold not just in the three hours but also the daily and then we get a solid rebound higher another one nvda nvidia three hours chart getting oversold it could get a little more hopefully it gets a little more and then we get a solid rebound rally how about pay PayPal, way oversold in the three hours chart. Maybe another gap down, it becomes way oversold on the daily too, and the probability of a rebound rally becomes highly likely. How about Roblox, RBLX, three hours chart. Once again, way oversold, waiting and waiting for a rebound rally. Another one, the ticker TAN, this is the ETF for solar, way oversold. It could move higher in a rebound rally. Again, I can do this, I could find charts all day long, but I don't have the time. So all what you have to do is look at your program, look at these charts, make a list of the names that are really oversold, look at the options grid, which ones are the best bang for the buck, and make your decisions accordingly. Lastly, moving on to the conclusion of this video. What do we have on the economic calendar this week? Monday, tomorrow, nothing. Then we have Tuesday, the 26th. We have durable goods. We have the chiller home index. This will be important. And then we have the Consumer Confidence Index along with new home sales. Wednesday, the 27th, we have pending home sales and home ownership rate. Thursday, the 28th, we have initial jobless claims. And lastly, on Friday, 29th, we have the Employment Cost Index and the Core PCE. This will be important because this is what the Fed looks at. We also have the Chicago PMI along with the University of Michigan Consumer Sentiment Index. Lastly, what do we have on the earnings calendar? Monday, we have Coca-Cola, Activision Blizzard, and Whirlpool. Tuesday, we have Alphabet, Microsoft, Visa, GM, UPS, all important names. Wednesday, we have Boeing, Ford, Meta, PayPal, Qualcomm. Thursday, we have Amazon, Caterpillar, Apple, McDonald's, Twitter. Lastly, on Friday, we have Bristol Myers, Abvi, Honeywell, Exxon, and Chevron. I will make up my own list in tomorrow's video, but for now, looking at this list, which name do you think will support a market rally higher? Will it be good earnings from Amazon, for example? Will it be Apple? Will it be Microsoft, Alphabet? Let me know in the comments. But for now, this is all I got for you. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. I will talk to you again tomorrow.